here, you won't be hearing the name of the man in this story, though he's considered one of the greatest movie makers America has produced. Is it because Errol Morris is too good for Hollywood? A lot of people think so. His films are unlike anything the big studios produce, but once you've seen them, you can never forget them. They're movies about real people, some of the oddest, most interesting people you will ever meet, people in many ways just like Errol Morris. The story really doesn't matter that much. You could make films about lots and lots of different stories. It's the people that inhabit these stories that count. I never saw anything more perfect in my life than to see the perfection of God himself. Morris has been making documentaries for more than 20 years. There are no sets, no actors, no scripts, because frankly, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Come on. I want my mama. Oh, so sheep. He's good to eat, too, but I don't eat them, but people do eat them. <laughs> An Errol Morris film is a feast of eccentricity, whether it chronicles the characters tucked away in the town of Vernon, Florida, or the passing of the family dog in California. You know, I feel like I know him. Is that right? That face, that smile. He's quite feel... some dog. There's the caretaker of a wondrous garden. This is all done from memory. You know what an animal looks like, and so you just start making an animal. For all their differences, the people in Morris's film share one thing in common. They love to talk. Take the old boys puzzling over the suicide of a friend. Why he wanted to take his shoe off to pull the trigger, I don't know. Then the very next damn day after we was working, and he said that day, he says, that'll be the last thing I ever do is to shoot myself, which it was. The art of the interview in your films is for the interviewer to shut up, create a silence that the subject has to fill. And my experience is that people, people want to tell you their story. If I don't do that, I just reach out on my finger. Well, it removed his head from the gun barrel. If you let people talk, you avoid interrupting them. They will reveal to you in short order who they really are. What fascinates Morris is not only who people are, but who they think they are. And I'd specifically design my office so that I could display the maximum trophies. It's not just the world around them, but the world inside them, what Morris calls mental landscapes. Each film is a collection of monologues, long, sometimes rambling speeches of the heart in which people always reveal much more than they realize. You know, there's this idea, I am myself, so presumably I know myself better than others. Absolutely wrong. I think often we can see others far more clearly than we can see ourselves. I can't decide whether you are uncomfortable with yourself or whether you're supremely confident in your own skin. I think it's one or the other, but it's hard to tell. Uncomfortable. I think that's an easy answer. If I've made a series of films about uncomfortable characters, it's because I'm one of them. Errol Morris makes films that I can't wait to see. Film critic Roger Ebert says yeah. Morris ranks alongside directors like Hitchcock and Fellini. After 20 years, I haven't found another filmmaker who intrigues me more in terms of his off-center, off-beat, very individual approach to the mystery of human nature. The latest Errol Morris film is called Mr. Death. So you're adding these snaps here? I wouldn't use them here, only at the end. His typical attention to detail is a labor of love for a film about death. Mr. Death, Fred Lucher. The human body is not easy to destroy and it's not easy to take a life. Lucher designs and repairs execution equipment. He is convinced that he can make capital punishment painless. I sleep with the comforting thought of knowing that those persons that are being executed, with my equipment, that these people have a better chance of having a painless, more humane, 
and dignified execution. Fred Lucher is, like all of us, a complex person. My hope is people can go and see this film and become engaged like I have been in the question of who he is. A mystery, a mystery story, but a mystery about personality. It's a mystery that deepens. What makes a film an Errol Morris film is that it takes audiences where they don't expect to go. In Mr. Death, the journey leads to genocide. Fred Lucher, the execution expert, is hired by modern-day Nazis to look for scientific proof that the Holocaust never happened. Now I will find another sample of brick from the wall we were not able to get at from the surface, which is over here. The film follows Lucher as he steals pieces of the Nazi gas chambers to test for cyanide residue. Whether or not these facilities were used for gas execution, that's not a mystery. I don't believe they were. He wrote what is now known as the Lucher Report, a Bible for Holocaust deniers. In it, he claims that there were no Nazi gas chambers. There's no mystery about whether the claims that he makes are right or wrong. They're wrong. Wrong, 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 and wrong. The mystery is not about his claims. The mystery is about why he's making those claims. I have a compelling urge and perhaps a responsibility to countless generations who come after me. A responsibility to the truth. Yeah, yeah. Is he a bad guy? Is he crazy? What's going on here? The audience wants you to tell them. Well, and you refuse to do that. They leave the theater with more questions than they came in with. Good. If part of what I do is make people think, that's OK. I can live with that. You see, that's where Earl Morris gets you, because he's like a magician. You're looking at the left hand, which is the subject of the film, and the trick is being done over here. When the film is over, you realize it was about a lot more than you thought it was, and it's about a different subject than it seemed to be. Mr. Death features no Morris's trademark style of interviewing. His subjects speak directly into the camera. It's a system Morris designed. He calls it the Interatron. You can say things on the phone that you would never, ever in a million years say to someone who is sitting directly across from you. And the Interatron, my interviewing machine, plays on that idea. The idea is to get the person to speak freely. Somehow, talking to a TV seems less intimidating. But for the viewer, the result is much more intimate, because the person on screen is looking right back at them. Let's give it a try. OK. We are looking at each other's live video images, but we are, in fact, not looking at each other. Simple as that. What does this get you? This ability to create an interview where someone is talking to me, and it's as if they're talking directly to the audience. When you feel that there's a moment of contact, I know you are, you know I am. Our heads are wired up in some way that makes eye contact very, very important. We all recognize the power of that connection when it happens. Morris's first film in 1978, Gates of Heaven, made a powerful connection with Roger Ebert. One of his films, Gates of Heaven, I picked on my list of the 10 greatest films of all time because it is totally impenetrable. It is a mystery after 50 viewings that I have never solved. The film is a look at two pet cemeteries and the people touched by the lives of their dead pets. When a dog dies suddenly, like Trooper died, the moment of decision came. What do we do with them? And I could often think of the uh, of trooper's face, and I say, where are you going to put me? There's something to life that, even when you discard something of an inanimate nature, you dispose of it with some kind of a reverence. You're saying this Pet Cemetery film is one of the 10 greatest movies of all time? Yes. You can approach this film in a dozen different ways. It just doesn't have a bottom. You can't get to the bottom of it. And you can't decide, no matter how often you see it, if it's a comedy or a tragedy. Tragedy struck Errol Morris as a young boy. 
His father died of a heart attack when he was only two years old. Morris's mother raised him and his older brother by herself. My mom would always say, you should be a doctor like your father. But I didn't know my father. I knew my mom. I always told her, I don't want to be like my father. I want to be like you. Uh, she was very much my role model. Still is, even though she died four years ago. Life's hard lessons form a lens through which Morris films the world. I think it taught me, although I may not even realize it, that the world can be a really capricious, crazy place. Things can go wrong, terribly wrong. Things had already gone terribly wrong for Randall Adams by the time Errol Morris happened to find him. Adams was on death row in Texas for the murder of a Dallas police officer in 1976. Morris's investigation of the case became The Thin Blue Line. I think it may be the only film that really solves a murder. Through interviews and reenactments, a technique Morris pioneered, The Thin Blue Line revealed that the key witnesses against Adams had lied. The film turned the case upside down. Soon after the movie was released, so was Randall Adams, cleared of all charges. When Adams flew home to Ohio, Errol Morris was waiting to greet him. It's only a job. Yeah, 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 yeah. Give everybody a shot. Three months later, Randall Adams sued Errol Morris. You got him off death row, and he sued you. Yes. Uh, under the belief that I was making a fortune for the film. You see what it is, though. It's the perfect Errol Morris story. Well, yes. What would life be like if it was devoid of irony? The greatest irony is Morris actually lost money on the film. You ever make money on a motion picture? A little bit. I have supported myself by making commercials, not by making movies. Those commercials have probably reached a larger audience than Morris's films ever have. Commercials for Levi's, Honda, and Miller Beer. Is your name Sally? Sally the Salad Eater. No, you're a high life man, and you don't care who knows it. You're not scared to enjoy Miller time. Although Morris has found commercial success with his commercials, he has not been recognized for his documentaries with an Oscar. Right. Do you care? Of course I care. Really? Yes. Why, that surprises you? Well, I thought of you as more of an artist than a person interested in commercial recognition. Part of being an artist is being interested in commercial recognition. He's too good to win in the documentary category. He's too good for an Academy Award. He's too good for an Academy Award. The Academy Award documentary branch doesn't have people smart enough to understand why Errol Morris makes Oscar-winning documentaries. And they didn't seem to understand this year either. Mr. Death, the film Morris thinks is his best yet, wasn't even nominated. Errol Morris may be disappointed, but not deterred. I make these movies because I need to make them. Need to make them? Need to make them. Part of who I am is finding out about the world, and movie making is my way of doing it.